Cornwall. Behind one of the wildest and most romantic coastlines in Britain lies Bodmin Moor. Barren, windswept, and dominated by huge, craggy tors. Weird granite outcrops that have been sculpted by millions of years of harsh Cornish weather. This is a landscape that's been witness to thousands of years of human history. A recent archaeological survey recorded hundreds of prehistoric settlements here. But no one can say for sure how old they are, or even if they're all the same age. Do we have any idea how many people would have lived here during the Bronze Age? Yeah? When we carried out the survey, we recorded at least 200 settlements and 1,500 individual houses within those settlements. But what we can say with certain is there were at least a couple of hundred people up here at any one point, maybe even a couple of thousand. Is this a doorway? It is, yeah. It is eerie, the idea of going into somewhere that's maybe 5,000 years old. What exactly are we going to do here, Francis? We're going to do an excavation, dig a hole, and find evidence that will suggest, yes, this was a house, or no, it was used for livestock, and we'll also date the thing. I mean, we don't actually know that all of these are roundhouses. I mean, some of them could be stock pens, they could be clearance cairns. If we can identify areas of burning, that may indicate hearths, and so help with the interpretation. Then we've got the whole landscape beyond. But no one's been able to accurately date the whole settlement. Some structures on the moor could be thousands of years older still because 500 metres away to the northeast is another huge man made feature. We suspect it's Neolithic, and if it is, we're talking at least 2,000 years before the Bronze Age. But our local experts think that the first settlers here were drawn towards Row or Rao Tor. They'd have been in awe of these rocky outcrops, and there's evidence that they were worshipping here. Here at um, Rautor, we've got the hilltop enclosure, um, which we know um, was probably Neolithic in date, with other examples elsewhere on Bodmin. And these are almost certainly some kind of tribal gatherings, uh, centres for ritual ceremonies, a meeting place for people to come together and sort of celebrate their lives within the landscape. I think it's one of those sites where what's below ground actually might not be as informative as actually what's above ground. There's the stone sizes, there's the shape and size of, of these banks or cairns, whatever they are. We can look at how they're constructed, what they line up within the landscape. So this is a classic case. We've got to start looking at the obvious and try to understand what it's telling us. Hello. Yo. In Phil's trench, he's beginning to suspect this bank is far from being a random pile of stones. And what I'm noticing too, this is bang on line with the edge of the cairn. There's a load of upstanding stone. They just stick up out of the ground. Oh, yeah. And they go right the way through here. I reckon this is going to prove to be the edge of the cairn. The build-up and the makeup of it is going to be over that side. And on that side, it's a collapse where it's fell out. Tumble up. And I've got exactly the same thing on my side. The light here on Rotor would have been as dramatic to the ancients as it is to us today. They worshipped the sun and ran their lives by it. And thinking about it, so do we. Despite the impetuous weather, it's been a good first day in our two house circles. The diggers have finally got into their stride. Over at the Cairn, they're now looking at stones that haven't been seen for thousands of years. And look at this. We're now deeper than the antiquarians got down to, and this surface too is maybe 5,000 years old. And tomorrow we're going to dig into it to see whether this was a place where people lived, or maybe where they buried their dead. I think you can vaguely see across here where it used to be and there's fewer stones, but um, mm. we, we've gone out beyond that, and you can see here all, all these, these collapsed stones here, which just go over the wall of the house there. There's masses of them. It's huge. I'm, in fact, I think there might be even too many for a wall there. <laughs> yeah. And we have had a, few, um, a, a couple of finds as well. There you go, a little thumb scraper. Oh, wow, look at that. And it's been burnt. Yeah, it's burnt flint, and it was found outside the walls just over there. Oh, that's interesting, because the two scrapers that were found by Dorothy Dudley's team were also outside. Look, there are these dots oh. there, just outside the entrance. And have you seen anything that might be a target for carbon dating? Possibly. You see 
the, the, the layer that we've come down onto there. Yeah, it's all quite nice, black. Nice dark black, and in the very centre of it, there mm -hmm. is in fact a, a quite a strong concentration of charcoal. I, I think we, if we put a, a slot across the back or something, and got a section down there and got a good sample of it, yeah. we probably could get something. At last, we're getting to grips with these stone circles. We've got trenches open in two separate buildings, and it would be fantastic if they were both part of the same potential Bronze Age village. But without doubt, the biggest mystery on the site is Phil's Neolithic cairn, built 6,000 years ago by the earliest farmers who only had stone tools. This monumental structure is over 500 metres long, and Francis believes it's no coincidence that it points east and towards the Tor. He's also convinced that it's unique in Britain, with only one or two other Neolithic monuments even remotely like it. When we were up here yesterday in the pouring rain, it looked to me like a rather random jumble of stones that you might put up to stop sheep wandering about. <laughs> but looking at it now, it looks like a really big structure. Well, the thing is, Tony, about these really big structures, they're very carefully put together, or the whole thing collapses. So I'm hoping that Phil has got good evidence for how the thing was actually built. I mean, you can actually see it on the surface, Tony. I mean, if you look up the monument, you can see that there are actually two parallel rows of stones running right the way up its length. And we've actually got some evidence of it in the trench here. Look. There's that big boulder which is sticking up through the surface of the grass. And we've got these big boulders coming down here. And actually, the infill is much smaller boulders. And if you really want to see the other side much more clearly, look at that whacking great stone in there. Oh, yeah, yeah. So what you've got are these, these two parallel, they're, they're like walls. So do you think the original shape would have been like a gentle slope and then a flat top? Yes, I think it is. I think it's definitely got a real definite shape to it. What about the buried soil? Well, we're just beginning to get a point where I think we've got it at the top is this sort of browny grey stuff. But the important bit is this very black stuff. Now that black stuff is the buried soil. But the important thing is that it's underneath this stone here. OK, we've got something that looks like a wall, but how do we know it's prehistoric? Why couldn't it be from any period? Well, it's the formality of that facing which is very, very striking. It's been deliberately placed there, and I think placed there to be seen from either side. And this is exactly what you get around the huge Neolithic burial mounds, the chambered tombs of Orkney and Ireland and all over the place. And that is very much a Neolithic feature, or even an earlier Bronze Age feature. I'm, I'm actually quite excited about it, because I think that's as diagnostic as anything else uh, we've found today. Absolutely. It would have been a heck of a lot of work. Oh, yeah. Well, the, the whole point of these huge monuments is to bring families and people together from a, from a large area of countryside. So uh, the big monument represents a whole series of, of, of gatherings of the tribes. It's job creation, it's keeping the unemployment figures <laughs> down. <laughs> <laughs> to think that people were designing and building structures like this up to 6,000 years ago is mind boggling. From this work on Bodmin Moor, Ben and Henry have been able to track how man has changed this landscape. 10,000 years ago, in Mesolithic times, Hunter-gatherers would have roamed through forests here, searching for food and shelter. 3,000 years later, at the dawn of the Neolithic period, they began to choose places to settle and cleared this landscape to graze their animals. A few thousand years later still, in the Bronze Age, they began to farm on a big scale, clearing even more of the woodland. So when did people start chopping the trees down? About 4,000 BC, at the beginning of the Neolithic. How did they do it? The stone axes, it must have taken forever. <laughs> well, yes, that's how we used to think. But we do now know that throughout the Mesolithic, people were managing the edges of woodland uh, using fire. And then every so often, the fire would get out of control and burn down a great swathe of land. So um, they did both, I think. <laughs> Well,
We're losing the light now and the mist's coming in. You can hardly see Rotor anymore. And all day we've been beavering away at this stone circle, although frankly to very little avail, until in the last few minutes Ian discovered this. It's a hearth. In other words, people were living here. This isn't just an animal pen or a cairn, it's part of a settlement. There is a hearth, and that hearth has got charcoal in it, and that charcoal will give us a radiocarbon date that will fix the period when this house was in use. But science can be fallible, and none of our radiocarbon samples subsequently proved to be conclusive. So actually, the best method for dating these houses will be good old-fashioned archaeology piece of pottery would be nice. Over at Phil's Trench, the Neolithic bank cairn is proving to be a far more complex structure than we could ever have expected. So rather than going for a second trench, Phil's decided to concentrate all his efforts on deciphering this cross-section of the monument. It's just after lunch on our final day and at last something's come up in Trench 3 that could focus this whole dig. It's a small sherd of pottery. And this could be the first piece of evidence that puts our house circle firmly into the Bronze Age. Carl, I'm so, so excited about this because this is the first piece of pottery we've had in this trench. Well, I think you're very right to be excited. Um, this is um, Bronze Age pottery. It's what we call Travisca ware here in Cornwall. It dates from the Middle Bronze Age. So yes, this is a very exciting piece. And I've just noticed on the interior, if you look carefully, you can see the black area. Yeah. That's actually internal residue, and that's the last meal that was cooked in this pot. So we're, we're, we're thinking it's about 1500? Yeah, it's around about 1500 BC. It's odd that something that looks so insignificant can tell us so much. This piece of Cornish Travisca ware confirms this was a Bronze Age home. And what's more, we know they were cooking here three and a half thousand years ago. Back in the farmhouse, Ben and Emma are beginning to run tests on some floor surfaces from the house in Trench 1 and material from Phil's cairn. Organic matter, such as discarded food or animal dung, rots down and leaves phosphates. Animal dung was commonly used as fuel in Bronze Age houses, and by running these tests, it could give us an indication of the level of human activity. Oh, look, you can see it going already over here, which is always good. Oh, yeah. You can just see here, you see the sort of blue halo we've got developing there. Mm. Now, the faster the sample goes blue is also meant to be a sign of high levels of, of, of phosphate. So if we keep an eye on which samples are going quickly... It's quite interesting, that's because of the hearth. Ah, now there you go. <laughs> because? Well, obviously, you sat around the fire, just waste, rubbish being dropped onto the ground, and that's, that persists in the soil over, over the millennia, basically. Emma, what are your initial impressions? Um, basically, we've got the hearth sample that's gone very blue, very quickly, lots of phosphate, lots of activity. All the way through the, the centre of the house, we've got, you know, again, evidence of phosphate. And even outside of the door, and that's really gone quite blue, and that went quite fast, didn't yeah. it, Ben? Yeah. Again, we've got evidence of phosphate. On the lower line, there are three that have hardly any phosphate at all, and one with just a tinge. Where were they from? Phil's trench, from the bank cairn. Um, as you can see, we're not really getting much evidence for, for phosphate, high phosphate levels in those at all. So, you know, a clear distinction between the different trenches in terms of the concentration of phosphates in the soils. This is the sort of science I can really identify with. These organic remains have been locked in the soil for thousands of years. The phosphates also tell us there was little human or animal activity near the cairn. It was possibly a place kept sacred to the memory of the ancestors. Back on the moor, real archaeology is catching up with the science. Bronze Age pottery seems to be coming up everywhere. In Trench 1, Matt's found some more near the hearth. For two and a half thousand year old pot, this is really special. It's got that decoration on it, hasn't it? Yeah, where the, where the cord's been the, pressed into it. Yes, it's Travisca ware. It's exactly like what Carl was showing me earlier on. That's, that's some time in the Bronze Age, isn't it, Francis? Yes, it is. It's in the Middle Bronze Age, to be precise, um, ah. between roughly 1500 BC and 1000 BC. Right. And this is another piece, oh. also of Travisca ware, but oh. I think slightly classier, that yeah. one, with the cord impressed. Uh, chevrons, zigzags. Absolutely. And that yeah. came from Rakshar's trench, along with another right. little bit in here. Now, 
the importance of that, of course, is that all of his pottery is identical. Mm. And that means that the three houses that we've dug out of all of these houses are all contemporary. And that means, I would guess, a penny to a quid. But all of the houses are part of a village. So we have ourselves a Middle Bronze Age village. That is absolutely <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> This is the first time that anyone's been able to confirm that this is a Bronze Age village, which is a great achievement. And our environmental team can add to the story. There's no evidence in the pollen analysis that our Bronze Age farmers grew any crops up here. It seems they carried on clearing the trees for fuel, and over the centuries, the soil became too acidic to support anything else. It would seem that unwittingly, Generation after generation of Bronze Age people were responsible for changing the face of Bodmin Moor forever. Raksha's team were the first to find that much needed dating evidence. And with just an hour to go, they've uncovered something else that could take the history of this settlement back much further. If I just put those two pieces together there, just I think the brilliant thing about this is that is an old break. You can see the dirt in there. Uh, so they've used it, it's broken, and they've just thrown it back in there. And you're actually at the bottom now, aren't you? I am, yeah. That, that's fantastic. That's like the best dating evidence that we could have. <laughs> Our finds people are very excited by this manky bit of flint. Technically, it's a bit of rubbish, a byproduct from making a prehistoric blade or scraper. They believe it could be early Neolithic, about 6,000 years old. And this tells us that this settlement actually goes back to the time the earliest settlers were building the cairn. It's one of the most enigmatic structures we've ever investigated on Time Team. And Phil's the first archaeologist to have been allowed to excavate it fully. I don't think television can give you a sense of the magic of this monument. It's so big in the landscape. There's so much work involved in it, and it points so dramatically at the tour. So what do we do, guys? We dig a sucking great hole in the middle of it. Why did we do that, Francis? Well, I think it's essential, Tony, that we actually get down to the buried land surface, the old topsoil under the monument, right at the centre. Why? What's so important about that? Well, you know, throughout this whole project, we've been thinking and talking about the buried soils. What that does is represents the, the environment that was there when they began the monument. It's the first part of the story. And the first part of the story of this part of the site is that they took took the turf off. And that's crucially important because we know from other sites in Britain that the, the actual alignment of, of, of the bank or, or the barrow was actually cleared of soil first. It's a sort of religious ritual purification of the ground before you put bodies in it. It would have been unbelievably spectacular. I must say, Phil, often you show me prehistoric finds and your eyes are full of crazed excitement and I'm thinking it's actually a bit boring, but this has got to be one of the best pieces of archaeology that we've ever done on Time Team, hasn't it? It's certainly one of the best I've done in oh, donkey's years. This feature shows us just how sophisticated the ancient people were in their relationship with the landscape. They'd have thought of the tour as we now think of a cathedral or mosque. And on solstices and other significant feast days, they'd have left their homes to process towards the rising sun to commune with their ancestors. And the spirit of Rotor is as potent now as it was then, continuing to draw pilgrims here for thousands of years, from the Roman times up to the present day. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. Please join us on this exciting journey. We need more support to make more episodes. Stilton sits just off the A1 near Peterborough and it's close to the Neen Valley, a major centre of the Roman pottery industry for 250 years. So it's no surprise that the fields around this town have been producing bits of Roman pots, bowls and vases yeah. for years. Three, look at that. Four, there's just pieces all, there's another one there. Yeah. There's a bit there, look. Oh gosh, yes. 
It hasn't come very far. It's not very braided, is it? No. But it's the sheer amount and quality of the finds coming out of these ditches that have really caught the team's imagination. So we're not wasting any time, as we're going to have to open a very big, very deep trench before we reach any archaeology. But if the previous finds are anything to go by, it'll be worth the effort. We were just about to do a scene about this coin that Philip has just found when there was a yell from over here. So let's have a look at this one too. Finds really are starting to come up, aren't they, Helen? Well, it's, I suppose it's, it's, it's... When you look very hard, you're going to find things on these interesting bumps of land. What's this one? It's a Celtic silver oh, unit. Oh, Goodness me. Oh, fantastic. This Celtic or native British coin dates to the first century BC, suggesting there was trade, or at least activity, going on here at least a hundred years before the Romans arrived. And what's the coin that we were going to do a scene about? Well, it's silver and it's actually a penny, but for some reason we call them shatters or skeets these days. Uh, and it's one of the most common kinds of Series E, dates to the early 8th century, and they're found all over eastern England and Holland as well. Fabulous finds for so early oh, in the dig. Yeah. But do they actually tell us anything? Well, it tells us that activity stretches back a few hundred years before the Romans were here making pottery, and a few hundred years afterwards as well. So it looks like we'll have more than just the Roman archaeology to deal with here. I think the signal is so strong here that there was undoubtedly a kiln so at this point. point. So could, could, could it be possible that the kiln has totally gone and what we're looking at is the clay underneath that has been heavily burnt? It's possible, yeah. Be disappointing. But the real shock is in Trench 2, where we've just discovered the last thing you'd expect on an industrial site. Well, we definitely seem to have got the, uh, the shin bone here. But then look, a very nice set of metatarsals, yes. which our footballers are very fond of breaking. What we seem to be missing in the middle is the whole of the, the, ribs. the ribs and the <laughs> vertebrae, which we definitely need. Because from the teeth wear, we might be able to say something about the age of the adult, and from the shape of the skull, we might be able to say something about its sex. Yeah. In fact, we seem to have two burials, as Matt's just uncovered some more bones at the other end of Trench 2. This site just gets curiouser and curiouser, and we now have two very different investigations on this small hill. So as the delicate unpicking of the burials gets underway, the more physical industrial dig continues with Phil and John opening a third trench over another anomaly that John's also convinced is a kiln. Look at this burnt clay that's coming around there, and it comes around there, back along there. It's just completely, well, I want to say it's nearly circular. It's unusual, isn't it? Well, it is. Over on the other side, they're still digging through metres of dark, thick clay. But over here, just inches below the surface, we've already got a really good archaeological story, haven't we, Matt? Yep, you can see we've got the second body here. Head to the west there, feet to the east. It's very delicate, very thin bone, so I'm thinking it's probably quite a young child or something like that. Um, we don't know the date of it yet, but it looks to me like it's cutting through these layers of all the pottery and bits of broken up kiln in it, so definitely post-Roman, post-kiln. So would your best guess be Anglo-Saxon? Could be, yep. And the first body is over here. You've got the skull! Yeah, it's a bit of a jumble mess because um, we've had a bit of plough activity in this region. But, um, you know, we've got the lower jaw and look at its teeth, it's fantastic. Kerry! Come over here, mate. So, what are you seeing on that level? What we've got is a much earlier uh, Roman surface, to, uh, well, at least one and a half, two metres below. And it's absolutely stuffed full of pottery. Wow. And that's from one sweep of the bucket. And that hasn't been broken by the bucket? No, that's all breaks. You can see the dirt on the sides there. Francis, can you see it's got all this shelly stuff in it? Yeah, it used to add shell. It, it made the pottery dry better when mm. they were making it. So what's your strategy going to be now? What I'm going to do is finish this and get up to the section there, then we'll clean it up and then we'll dig down into it. It's quite gracile, isn't it? It's not, it's not robust. It's, and this part of the mandible, it's not you know, really chunky or... Yeah. We've got no big kind of muscle attachments, no. have we? So if anything, that's looking more like a lady. But as we start to remove the skeletons from Trench 2, it becomes apparent that we haven't just got two burials, but the remains of up to seven different individuals, including children and babies. I just wanted to show you this. So I heard you talking about the teeth. 
there. Can you see? Oh, wow. The molar popping through. And so obviously it was a young child. I was wondering kind of what, how, how old that would be, what age that? Yes, look at that. You Cheers. look at that tooth there, it's, it's very big. small, so that's, you could almost say that it was in its milk teeth still. I think that makes this as a pretty young. It's about yeah. seven? About seven. seven, yes. It's now clear that this was a significant Saxon site. The task for us is to try and work out what was happening here 300 years after the Romans left. I do think we have finally got the full extent of it. I reckon you're right. Thankfully, the Roman element of this complex field is beginning to make more sense. In Trench 3, Phil now has something that's beginning to look remarkably kiln-like. And now that the burials have been removed, we can also confirm that Trench 2 contains a kiln although it seems to be of a different construction to the one in Phil's trench. I think what you've got, actually, Helen, is a stone-lined cut. In other words, it could be the, the actual chamber of a kiln. Oh. And this is the, like the stone lining for the cut. That's the kiln interior, oh, and then you would have had the fire bricks or clay lining, the inner face of that wall, forming the actual furnace chamber for the kiln. It's now almost the end of day two, and it feels like we've got more to investigate than ever. And that doesn't even include the masses of newly uncovered archaeology in the ditch trench. Oh, crikey, look at that lot. You can see the amount of pot we've got yeah. crammed into the centre there. The other thing about it, not only is it a lot of pot, but you can see the dark colour of the yeah. soil. Yeah. There's a lot of charcoal in there, and of course there's waterlogged wood in there. Not a lot, but it's there. Aye, that's quite incredible. I mean, it must mean there's a whole lot of stuff under this field, is not it? Extraordinary. And this is the trench that everyone's getting really excited about. Yesterday they were speculating that in it is a Neolithic causewayed enclosure, which is very, very rare. Francis has only ever discovered one in his life. Francis, now you've had a look at it, is this the second? Well, I'm very excited, Tony. First thing this morning, we found this superb Neolithic flint. It's beautifully sharp and, you know, I, I'm very excited about it. Well, I was for about 10 minutes. And then we found this. And this is a piece of Anglo-Saxon pottery. That's just as exciting. <laughs> <laughs> hang on, well. hang on, what are you saying? Are you saying it is a Neolithic ditch that's been reused in Anglo-Saxon times, or are you saying it's not Neolithic at all? I'm saying if it was Neolithic and reused, I'd expect a great deal more flint than this. Um, I'm afraid, I think it's Anglo-Saxon, end of story. So why is that exciting? Well, because they don't turn up very often, and to actually have the ditch we have post holes, we have burials. It all starts to look like an Anglo-Saxon settlement. That's tremendously exciting. This is Time Team. We find something we think is very exciting. It turns out to be something else. It's even more exciting. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's it. It's all right. Oh, look. Yeah, there's some pots in there. There's definitely pots oh, hiding yeah. in there, yes. Other parts of our investigation here have been more straightforward. Thanks to some experimental archaeology, we've now established that the local clays around Stilton were perfect for the Roman pottery industry. So how do you feel that went as a firing then, Rick? Well, as a piece of experimental archaeology, I think it's been very um, successful. Yeah. Back on the hill, more evidence from the Anglo-Saxon periods emerging. Brace yourself for treasure. Ta-da! Even I, as a Romanist, would recognise that as yep. a significant object. Absolutely. It may not Saxon be beautiful. Pinhead. Yep, Middle Anglo-Saxon, 8th, 9th century. Yeah. So it fits in brilliantly with the shatter Doesn't and it? with the pottery that seems to be coming out yeah. of the ditch, which is really tremendous. It's really That's exciting. Superb. I mean, I know it's building castles in the air, but an Anglo-Saxon ditch, a Middle Anglo-Saxon ditch round an island, yeah. it's beginning to look like, oh, could be a monastery. There are now all sorts of theories running around the site that we may have discovered a significant centre of Anglo-Saxon religion. Oh my goodness, what's that? What is that? It's another wall, and it's butting against the wall of the kiln. Somebody's built a wall into the kiln. My goodness. Hermits were effectively the first monks, and if this is a Middle Saxon hermitage, we found something incredibly rare because most hermitages now lie under some of Britain's most impressive abbeys and cathedrals. We know that the way the early church was organised, that's what people did. They went and lived miles from anybody else on retreat, we'd call it today, wouldn't we? Mm. Sort of, you know, in isolation. No, it is speculation, but it fits the archaeological evidence for that period. So, you know, I'm reasonably, reasonably confident that's what we've got. If it is a hermitage, how mm. important a site does it make it? 
Well, every so often we do a programme and I think what we find, that'll go into the textbooks because it's a good example of this or a, or a better example of that. And I think this is one of those, you know. You've got an enclosure from the geophysics, you've got um, Saxon pottery, you've got burials, you've got post hole buildings. That's the sort of thing that's going to get mentioned in any discussion about this period or this topic. So I think it's one of those. In so many other places, this would have evolved into one of the great Saxon and medieval abbeys and monasteries of Britain. For some unknown reason, that didn't happen here, and as a result, we've uncovered the rarest of archaeological finds, a hermitage. And this site still offers more. As the end of the day approaches, it turns out that the Saxons and Romans weren't the first people to recognise the importance of this small Cambridgeshire hill. It's been a good day for you, hasn't it? You've got your kiln, and you've got an Anglo-Saxon enclosure. Look what I've got for you. Another. Enclosure. Oh my God, look where, at where, where, where? Look, once you focus in on it, you can see it. If I turn it that way, it's like a pair of spectacles. But this is a double one on this side, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's your prehistoric one. So we're suddenly back into the Neolithic again. <laughs> we could be. It was the amazing amount of pottery in that field over there which led us to the kilns in this field here, which thankfully we found at last. But in fact, it was the discoveries on the final day that really got us excited. Not least the possible Anglo-Saxon hermitage complete with an enclosure. In fact, this whole story has gone from the Neolithic to the Anglo-Saxon and now in the final half hour back to the Neolithic again with John's geophys and what we think is a Neolithic enclosure. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more and you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites. Well, rain's forecast for the next three days, but at the moment it's spectacularly nice, isn't it? It's beautiful, isn't it? When did you first realise that there might be something under there? Well, I've ploughed this field about 25 times in the last 30 years. And as a rule, we would break two or three of these shear bolts every time we plough it. But then these finds started to come up. Yes, that's right. So metal detectors, they found a number of um, Roman coins and brooches that, which were confirmed by Dorset County Museum and Bournemouth University. And then this year a shadow appeared in the field? A square shape of lighter, chalky colour. About how big? About four times the size of that reservoir. Four times this big? Well, it's going to be some structure, isn't it, Guy? If there's a building that size on the top of the hill, it will be very, very exciting. We've got some structural debris here, which have started looking through. Some of that is not Roman, so I'm not quite sure yet, but there's a real enigma up here. One of our legion of Roman experts has been looking at the building material that's already been found. From the finds that we've got, can you tell what sort of Roman building it is? Well, not from this, because none of this is convincingly Roman. You're kidding. No, I'm not. I, I can see why people have thought it at first glance. Some of you think, oh yes, that looks like it's a piece of Roman imbrex, but it's actually very hard and got an uncharacteristically smooth surface. Same with this, it looks like a piece of tegula, the flange roof tile, but it's actually far too thin and it's been moulded and Roman brick and tile is handmade. This is going to be one of those digs. And the news gets worse. The field walkers' finds have been washed and mapped and there's nothing Roman. And Geophys are looking even glummer than usual. I wonder if our spectators have got any idea of how close to disaster we are. Everything now seems to hang on the only trench we've opened. Look, where's the boy Ashton? Where is he? Yeah, but that's a trouble. Should we go and get him? Might as well call in the wrinkled professor while we're at it. <laughs> I'm worried when you have a stern no. face. We got, we got what looks like our natural look coming yeah. on there. But look, there's some looks coming round here. And we appear to have an edge. What I was requesting is to take out a bit of this. Yeah, take out a bit more. And, and see whether or not we can. I mean, this if this is a, a ditch or something like this coming round. Yeah. Put you a need slot. to see that natural, the other side. That's what, it's exactly what I'm yeah. saying. OK, let's do that. What Phil thinks he's got is a man-made ditch cut into the natural geology. 
He's found one edge, and to confirm it, he needs to find the other one. Oh! One. That's the other side of it then. Nice one. That is, I like the look of that. Yeah. It's curving yeah. round, it's curving round. Looking better, isn't it? <laughs> She's pleased about that. <laughs> oh, I like the look of that. Hallelujah, good. there is some archaeology here. We now have two edges to our ditch. You're thinking flints and pottery, aren't you? <laughs> but this doesn't look Roman. Big too, they it? didn't build in curves but the people who came before them did, which is great for Phil, because he loves the prehistoric. That's got to be good, Mick. Got to be good. Farmer Roger's mysterious yeah. shadowy square might yet be evidence of something Roman. Does your geophys indicate anything which might have sheared his bolts? <sighs> I can I, hear you I... saying no before you've even said it. Look, with the eye of faith, you might just see something in there. Yeah. If I didn't know it coincided with Roger's sort of area, I wouldn't have bothered with it. Where is it? Well, we're, we're stood on it now. So do you reckon it's worth putting a trench in here? Well, we've got nothing to lose. Well, this is not the most scientifically placed <laughs> trench we've ever had, but uh, we'll have a go, John. We'll have a Why go. Why not? So another trench goes in without very much precision. It ditches. is a rather obvious ditch, isn't it? Yeah. Running right the way down But there. that couldn't matter less to Phil, who's now revealed a very nice curving feature which is producing artefacts. Bronze Age pot, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, I'd agree with that. That looks like sort of good early Middle Bronze yes, exactly. Age. Exactly. Exactly what you'd expect with a ring ditch like this. Which well, that's is, right. I mean, we're I certainly going to turn into a barrow, yeah. That's yeah. perfect. Not a, not a Roman in sight. Uh, <laughs> Excuse me while I just pummel you. If they're right and this is a barrow, then Phil's found part of a ditch that ringed a man-made mound, in the middle of which may be a burial. We've lost the middle of it because of the, the modern boundary, but it's there. Guy, do you think that this barrow has got anything to do with the Roman finds? Well, I've got to admit, it isn't exactly what I expected when I came <laughs> up here. But no, the reality is that... The Romans did pay a huge amount of attention to prehistoric monuments. After all, they were dotted around in the landscape, they were impressed by them, they made offerings to them. That could explain the Roman stuff up here. Phil, of course, has had the advantage of modern metal tools. The people who first dug it would have done so with deer antlers. That's a very interesting looking section you've got there, Phil. It's been a pleasure to dig, Mick, it yeah. really has. And even better to clean up. I mean, it does look glorious. And we've got the full story there, haven't we? That's right. It is the complete story mm -hmm. from the construction of the barrow, literally right through to the present day. Mm -hmm. See, what they've done is that they've, they've dug this very impressive ditch and, and they've had to go through this big seam of green sand churn. They needed rock drills to get through that, that, wouldn't they? Yeah, I know. Really oh, the first thing that's happened is that the top at the sides of the ditch up here have weathered down that's this material here, and it's covered up the base and the sides. All this top bit, I think that's plough soil, which is actually washed into the top of the ditch. But this is ploughing the barrow mound itself, probably, as well. Ah, but if you look here, see what we got there. Oh, crikey, that's grotty old stuff, isn't it? It's beautiful. It's a piece of an urn, Bronze Age urn. It's got the finger pinching. Oh, yeah, these are the finger marks of the potter on That's the outside. Right. So where's this from? Well, it's actually from the ditch itself. But right. you see, it, it's late Bronze Age. Right. And I think that what we're looking at here is, is um, an urn that's actually been placed in the mound. Right. And as the mound has been ploughed away, that fragment of urn has worked its way down right. into so the ditch. So this is out of the middle of the barrow. I fact. think this is out of the barrow yeah, yeah, itself. Yeah. Even though the mound itself has been ploughed away, bits of Bronze Age pot are circumstantial evidence of cremation burials in a classic barrow. It's one of the practices that arrived in Britain in the Bronze Age. So what was the difference between the Bronze Age people and the people before them? Well, primarily we see the kind of monuments they're building uh, in round barrows and we see very rich graves. We're seeing people accumulating wealth for the first time. So perhaps we can talk of, of the first time of, of kings or, or defined leaders. Prehistoric monuments are never just placed by chance on the top of any old high ground. Neighbouring hills and rivers and other local monuments can all shape where they're constructed. Stuart's looking at why this hilltop was favoured with a barrow. He's already found one possible clue. 
Our site appears to be almost completely encircled by rivers. Why that's significant, and why the Romans took an interest in the site, he's now got to figure out. So does that mean that this is a Bronze Age story? Well, what we've got is, you know, an undiscovered Bronze Age barrow that we've come across by uh, accident almost, which is obviously why the Roman stuff is here. And I think we've got the opportunity to have a good look at it now. We should do that. Most round barrows that we see in the UK, you've got a sort of a nice round ditch and the centre, we've got a mound, and somewhere in the centre, there's going to be a, a burial. But the more of these we dig, the more we realise that the mound itself covers sort of a, a multitude of sins. Sometimes there are burials, sometimes there's the remains of a house structure, sometimes there's the remains of a fire, sometimes it, the mound itself just contains a whole range of different artefacts, they are sort of tribal material, pottery, flint work, animal bone, is all accumulated in the mound as some kind of tribal marker, some kind of statement. So not all of them, have a burial smack in the centre. But by and large, <coughs> are they a round shape? Usually, I mean, when you see them in the landscape, what you see is sort of like one of these sort of comedy kneecaps sitting up there, as a, mm. that's the mound. But you never know what's actually inside there. It could be anything. Sometimes it's a body, but sometimes not. In our case, not. We've now excavated what we think's the centre, and there's no evidence of a burial. But from the ditch, Bridget has come up with a few fragments of bone. Just found some little bits of bone here. It's incredibly poor and degraded. Isn't and what it? worries me is if we've got a burial, yeah. I don't know if we're actually going to find the body itself. That, that's all there is, yeah. yeah. But I mean, there's charcoal in this soil as well. There is, yeah. I and mean, there may be another cremation or something that's been placed in the top of the ditch. Exactly. You can't see anything in the soil. There's no stains associated yeah. with burials or. Yeah. But we'll keep digging. After later examination, none of the bone could be positively identified as human. So, still no definite evidence of a burial here. Any evidence may have been scraped away with the mound itself, unless we've missed something in the middle. And there still seems to be some doubt about where that actually is. Indeed, Henry was so perplexed that he decided to plot the exact shape of our feature using his extremely expensive global positioning system which is accurate to a few centimetres. And he's made an extraordinary discovery. You have a look at the plan. This is our, the ditch of our... How um, crikey! ...whatever we have here. Now, you see it's not a circle. You can Presumably see... because it's not a circle, it's difficult to find a centre. Very difficult to find a centre. you sort of got a blob about two metres where it could be. Right. Around the centre there. And where is that on the ground? The centre of that... Yeah. ..is just down... We can see that, that stone there. But it's actually a whole area around that bit. But yeah, you want to be taking it at least a metre, metre and a half around that to give you an idea. So right. potentially under the section here. Can I borrow that? Because that's, that's a real conundrum, though, is I need to go mm. and think about that. And while Mick's struggling to digest this unusual shape, Bridge has turned up yet more surprises. Well, it looks like we've got a piece of burnt timber. And what's interesting about it, it looks as though it's been burnt somewhere else and then it's been dumped into the backfill of this ditch. How big is it? Well, you can see, we can see this much here, but there is a lot of burning up the other end there as well where everyone's digging. Um, that's also associated with some burnt daub. What's that mm. telling you, Mick? Well, it isn't quite what I'd expect with a barrow, although, you know, you do get funeral pyres for mm. burning bodies and so on, but it's, it's, it's rather helping with, with what is a very odd sight, it seems to me now. I mean, I'm going off the idea of it being a barrow. Oh, really? Yeah, but well, look at the shape of it. If it's that was your a... bike, you wouldn't get home in a hurry. Well, no, that's you? right. <laughs> and, you know, we, we, we've hardly got any pottery from it at all, you know. I mean, we've got a few odd bits that might be bits of cremation urn, and we've hardly got any bone from it, either cremated or ordinary yeah. bone. So I'm beginning to wonder whether it's a barrow at all or whether it isn't some other type of site. And you're extending the whole thing over here. What's going on? We've got some geophys anomalies here. What do they look like? They're just blobs on it, but given that that is looking very interesting and exciting now, we've got to spend the whole day looking at it. We've got to look at this as well to go with it. What do you reckon it is? I've no idea. I just, I just feel in me water that it's going to be very significant. You're a professor. You ought to be able to tell us. Yeah, but I think we're back in prehistory here, and yeah. that's, that's, you know, we need some specialists. I mean, Miles is our man for this, without any doubt. We've left the first field behind. All our efforts are now in the second field, investigating the barrow and the geophys blobs. They might be an entrance, which would be unusual in a standard Bronze Age barrow. 
It's one of a number of puzzles that have got the archaeologists scratching their heads about this monument. OK, right, Matt, if we can get a nice sort of metre section through that charcoal, that would be absolutely brilliant. Okay. Unlike most Bronze Age round barrows, our barrow isn't circular, as Henry revealed. And after his bombshell, we double-checked the middle area in case there was a burial there. But no, and no burials anywhere else either. And our puzzling monument seems to have had a palisade as well. So we've got the ditch swinging around here. Our army of diggers have got just one day of scraping and shoveling left to find out what this prehistoric thing is. Enclosures and barrows have a big timber facade on the outer edge. Encouragingly, there are plenty of finds. One that may be very significant has got Phil in raptures. Look at that profile, look at that curve down there. Classic scraper shape, that is. That ain't just a five minute job, that's beautiful that's workmanship. Beautiful. I mean, that's got to be late, nearly early bronze age, I would have thought. Amazingly, to an expert like Phil, a stone tool can be dating evidence. The trimming on this scraper suggests skilled craftsmanship from the Neolithic or Stone Age. Perfect thing for holding <laughs> These skills were largely lost in the Bronze Age when metal replaced stone tools. It may add yet another thousand years to our monument, and that would definitely account for the odd features. The thing about the history that's amazing is the finds that are coming out. They're coming out left, right and centre, and it's Ian who's really finding them, and I'm just looking at him jealous as anything. <laughs> what have you got? Well, he's just finding all these tools here. Cool. Look at them all. I mean, we've got, he's got this one here, wonderful thing. It's a scraper. He used to scrape off hides and things like that. There's this one here. That's another scraping edge. He's found there. this one here. <laughs> There's all sorts of things. We've also found some pottery in here. Absolutely brilliant stuff. This one here. You can have a thumb decoration there or a lug that's fallen off. What kind of period do you reckon this is? Well, I'd go for Bronze Age, but very early Bronze Age. Maybe transitional. I think you're probably about right, and I think one of a really good key indicator that sort of provoked discussion is from this piece of pottery here. It's a rim, and it's got whipcord decoration. What do you mean by that? Well, can you see here? You've got, like, a piece of string has been pressed into the wet clay before it was dried. The string decoration would have been applied before this massive collared urn was fired, about 4,000 years ago. Absolutely wonderful. It's just the most exciting trench I've worked on, I don't know for how long. We were so excited about this pottery that we asked you to drop everything and come up here from Salisbury to see us. What is it? Um, well, this is a very interesting little collection of early Bronze Age pottery. There seem to be several different vessels represented here, of which this is probably the best example. This is a rim from an early Bronze Age collared urn. Here. Do we know what that would have been likely to have been used for? Um, these vessels are quite often associated with funerary remains. Um, they're used as burial urns, ah. but they can also be used in a domestic context. Give us a date. What do you reckon? I'd say somewhere between 2000 and 1500 BC. Miles, what about the tools? Well, there's a nice sort of uh, range of scrapers and knives and notch flakes coming up, so uh, quite a, a dense collection of tools. Now, earlier today, you said to me, I'm sure this is Neolithic, and yet you're now saying that it's Bronze Age. Do we have a problem here? <laughs> well, the, certainly with the flint work, they're, so I would say, late Neolithic and or early Bronze Age. Yes, yeah, so there could be a chronological overlap between the two. What I don't understand is we've got this huge egg which is representing our site right and we've got our hedge here all these finds came from a trench just here on the ditch these ones came from here but nowhere round the rest of the ditch have we found anything at all what do you think is going on well i think it's important to bear in mind that all this material is coming from a, a very sort of organic rich charcoal rich layer in the upper levels of the ditch so there's there's some kind of deposit going on this is not rubbish material this is some kind of deliberate deposit of, of flint tools, so church tools and pottery. Why are people burying their tools and their well, pots? Well, people are coming up here in the very late Neolithic and early Bronze Age, depositing these tools, this pottery, in the upper levels of the ditch, in much the same way, I suppose, that 3,000 years later, the Romans are coming up and doing the same thing with their coins. This site has produced one of the biggest range of finds we've ever seen on Time Team. From 5,000-year-old Neolithic church tools 500-year-old medieval coins. 
There's something from every period. And together, they've unlocked the secrets of this site. We came here looking for a Roman temple and instead found what we thought was a classic Bronze Age barrow. But it's now clear that our thing began its life in the Neolithic about 5,000 years ago as an enclosure ringed by a ditch and quite possibly by a palisade which was later burnt. The enclosure may have been used to display dead bodies. Tools and pottery were also deposited in two sections of the ditch. In the Bronze Age, a mound was thrown up using material dug from quarry pits just outside the ring ditch. The mound was probably still visible in the Roman period, and local people passing by were moved to bury their coins next to it. Which is where we came in. Hello, my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan-funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models and masterclasses, plus lots more.